Buy your stat 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Greetings, Bio 6611. In this lecture, we're going to discuss some properties of estimators. We'll first introduce some notation, introduce some of the properties we can use to describe estimators, and then briefly demonstrate how we can utilize simulations to investigate these properties in practice. So let's start with some notation. Let's let this little bold x represent a vector of observations and we'll denote these as x sub 1 up to x sub n. So we have a sample of size n drawn from our population of interest. Now we'll let theta represent a population parameter and because it's in the population it represents the true value of that parameter. However, we know that we rarely measure the entire population and instead try to estimate the population parameter, usually with some random sample. That we will represent by this theta hat we see right here. Theta hat is going to be a function of our sample's data. So, for example, if we have theta hat x1 to xn here, maybe we're calculating the sample mean. And so we take the sum of our observations x sub i and we divide that by n. Now, most times instead of writing this entire piece here, we'll just instead write theta hat. One question we might have as we encounter different estimators throughout this course and the other courses in your statistical career and practice is how do we identify what is a good estimator? And how can we compare the performance of different estimators to choose the best one to use for a given context? We'll address this question by introducing some properties of estimators that we can use to describe their performance. The first property is a term we call bias. Theta hat we say is unbiased, our estimator, if its expected value is equal to the parameter of interest. In other words, we might write this mathematically as E of theta hat equals theta. And so there's a little bit of math and theory that goes behind this that we'll touch on in some other lectures, but we can note that if it has this property, we would say it's unbiased. Now in practice, we can calculate the bias of an estimator by taking the difference of the expected value of theta hat minus that true population parameter. An estimator that is unbiased, we could say is right on target, correctly identifying and estimating the quantity of interest. Another way of describing the performance of an estimator is its efficiency. For example, if we have two different estimators we wish to compare, maybe like the sample mean and the sample median, we might look at the efficiency of both estimators and their variances. We can do this more directly by looking at the ratio of two estimators that we call the relative efficiency. And so here we see we take that ratio dividing the variance of one estimator by the variance of the other estimator. We can then say theta hat is an efficient estimator if it reaches the kramer rao lower bound for its variance. Now this goes a little bit more into theory land than we really will touch on in 6611, but essentially this means that the variance is as small as it could possibly be for the given estimator and the type of problem we're trying to estimate. And in fact, only unbiased estimators can actually achieve and reach this kramer rao lower bound. We note that another sort of terminology we throw out is that an estimator is called asymptotically efficient if it reaches this kramer rao lower bound. And it does so as the sample size becomes infinitely large, or as we might say, as n goes to infinity. One other property of an efficient estimator that we'll see in a toy example here in the following slide is that an efficient estimator is precise. And so what do we mean by this idea of sort of precise? And we can see that at the bottom of the slide here, but first let's touch on the mean square error. This is a summary that combines both of these ideas of that efficiency and that bias we saw in the past slides. Now because the bias looks at the expected value of an estimator and efficiency looks at the variance, 
we might want something that actually combines those in one more holistic summary of the properties because there is this inherent bias variance trade-off we're dealing with in statistics where we'd love to have uh, an estimator that has both low bias and low variance but sometimes we have to make some give and take or choices when we're selecting the different estimators at our disposal. Now the MSE mathematically, the mean square error, can be stated as the expected value of theta hat minus theta, the true population parameter squared. Now this can be then written out and be shown to actually be equal and equivalent to that equation we have for the variance and then bias squared for our estimators. Now this helps to measure both the accuracy and precision of our estimator in one fell swoop. If we have a small MSE, that often will involve some trade-off again between that precision and accuracy or variance and bias. The targets we see on the bottom of the slide here demonstrate some of these properties. For example, sort of the dream scenario we would love to have for an estimator is this one at the far left, number one. It has low bias, so it's accurate, and low variance, so it's precise. And we see that because our points are right here in the center of the bullseye. And they're all clustered together very tightly. And so they're pretty consistent in where they are, accurate and precise. Now, options two, three, and four have various departures from this ideal scenario, where in scenario two, we see we have high bias because we're actually not achieving the bullseye, our estimate, while still being very precise with a low variance among the uh, observations or points are clustered far away from that bullseye point. In the third bullseye, we see an example where we have low bias, so it's fairly accurate because we are still centered around that bullseye. However, it's not very precise. The points are more spread out. There's more variability amongst our observations. And one of the more challenging and sort of worst case scenarios out of these four possible ones would be not only do we have high bias where we're not at even accurately estimating or homing in on that bullseye, but we also have high variance. We're not very precise. The points are sp more spread out than clustered together. Another thing we can think about when we're exploring the properties of our estimators is asymptotic consistency. We see that theta hat is asymptotically consistent, or often we just shorthand that to consistent. If that estimator that we have, that theta hat term, converges in probability to our true estimator theta, that population parameter. Now, again, there's a little more statistical theory that goes into this, so we'll leave it more at the point where we can say that the more data you collect, a consistent estimator will be closer and closer to that true population parameter. For example, there's a graphic from Wikipedia that shows as we collect more observations in our sequence of estimators, we see that it converges in a case where the truth actually is equal to 4. Once we have infinite observations, we actually are very consistent and will always estimate that the value, let's say the mean, is 4. Versus with fewer observations, we have more variability, as we see with these distributions there, uh, with T1, T2, or T3. So to close this up, let's just introduce an example of a simulation we can use to investigate the properties of estimators um, through making up data where we can assume a truth to actually evaluate what that population parameter is. Because again, in practice, we rarely know what the population true value will be. So let's look at how we can estimate bias in our other quantities from our simulations. So for example, we'll just, on this slide here, assume we have 100 data sets we simulate of sample size n. And for each of these data sets, each of the 100 data sets we create and simulate, we'll calculate that parameter of interest theta hat. Now the reason simulations, again, are so beneficial is that we generate the, true, uh, the data with the true knowledge of that parameter theta, because ultimately we're choosing what that true value will be in our simulations. And so if we're trying to get an estimate of what the bias would be of our estimator from our uh, simulations, which we see here we have little hats to illustrate technically they're both estimates being derived of the true population underlying parameters, we see what we would do is we would take the sum of our 100 different observations of theta hat, and so imagine if we were calculating let's say the sample mean, we would calculate the sample mean in each of our 100 data sets, we then add them up together, 
We would then divide by 100 the number of simulated data sets we did, and then subtract the true value of the population mean that we chose in our simulation. Now, ultimately we may wonder, why does this work? Well, this leverages an idea based on the law of large numbers, another topic of statistical theory that you'll cover in other classes in greater detail. But essentially what it says is that as we get more and more observations, we see, for example, here that the sum of our sample uh, parameter estimates divided by 100 will converge to the expected value of that actual observation. So the more simulations we generate and the larger our sample size we may have in our simulations together can have a better uh, idea of what that estimate will be. Now likewise we can also estimate the variance of the estimator from our simulations as well and calculate the sample variance of estimators across all of our simulations. So what we're doing here is we see again the variance of theta hat with a hat as well over var. We see we can calculate using the formula for the variance by plugging in our respective quantities of interest. So here we see we have our 100 simulated samples, j equals 1 to 100, and we're summing that over theta hat minus the estimate of our parameters across all of the simulations we've done. So for example, if it was the sample mean, we would be plugging in x bar from each of the jth simulated uh, data sets there, and over here we would actually have an estimate of x bar from all of our 1 to 100 simulated values. Therefore, mimicking the formula for variance we've learned in other lectures. Now, the good news uh, with using software like R is that we can actually, instead of calculating all of this by hand, actually use it to calculate things like the mean and the variance. So let's see an example of actually calculating the sample mean. And we'll do a simulation study where we have 1,000 simulated samples with a sample size of n equals 10, and we'll assume it's from a standard normal distribution, or in other words, a normal distribution with mean 0 and a variance of 1. Now, as we should always do with good reproducible concepts, we'll set the seed for reproducibility at the start of our little simulation here, and we'll set it as the class number 6611. And in this case, we will conduct a simulation study, which we can actually do here in one line of code. We see using the sapply function allows us to run, in this case, 1,000 simulated data sets. And within this function, we're going to, here with the r norm n equals 10, generate random samples from that standard normal distribution of size 10. We then see that we're wrapping that further in this mean of those 10 values. And so within this one line of code, we're combining multiple functions. And with s applied, we'll, 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 we'll return to simres a vector of 1,000 estimated sample means from this normal distribution uh, with sample size 10. Likewise, we can generate a histogram of these 1,000 simulated sample means that we see below. We can note as well, and we'll discuss this in other lectures as well, has an approximately normal distribution. Other things we can also note is that we can actually calculate all these properties of interest we elaborated on in the previous slides. For example, in this top component here, where I just drew the star, we can calculate the average of 1,000 sample means. So that 1,000 sample means we have, we can say, well, we know the true thing we simulated from was that normal distribution with, again, mean 0, variance of 1. What we see here is that we have the estimate of the mean across all 1,000 simulations is approximately 0. And so we can also, like calculating the mean, calculate here with our smiley face the variance of those 1,000 sample means. Here seeing that it's 0 0.0983, which we can note corresponds closely to our estimate of the mean or the variance of the mean, which will be equal to sigma squared here over n, or 1 over 10 equals 0 0.1. Now, with these quantities, of course, we can calculate things like our bias here, where again, because our mean is 0, we see that it's the same as our estimated sample uh, mean of the sample means. And also, we can calculate the mean square error here at the very bottom, where we see that we have our variance, we then are putting in that 
calculation for the bias squared. And we see that we have a fairly low mean square error of that 0.09833473 that matches the variance, uh, very closely matches that variance calculation we had above because of the minimal bias. And so we'll denote and discuss throughout the semester more opportunities for how we can conduct simulation studies that might be a little more expansive than this toy example, but this serves as a chance to see how we can apply and evaluate these properties of estimators with simulations to see their properties and maybe compare them uh, in the future on homeworks or in the real world.